Welcome to the Red Sneaker Podcast, your guide to success in the worlds of writing and publishing. Now, here's your host, best-selling author and founder of the Red Sneaker Writers Center, William Bernhardt. Hello, Red Sneaker Writers. This is episode 39, going out on February 24, 2020. This podcast is for Red Sneaker Writers, people who are serious about having a writing career, and want some practical knowledge to help them do it. Is there a difference in the sound quality in this episode? Are you not hearing the silverware clattering in the background? Yeah, we're not on the cruise ship anymore. This is the first podcast episode since the WriterCon cruise ended, and I guess it's a sign of how fun and successful that program was that I'm already planning the next one. In fact, I just got a contract this morning from Rare Royal Caribbean, and it looks good. So don't be surprised if on the next podcast I'm telling you about how you can get involved in the WriterCon Cruise for 2021. I also recruited three new speakers plus an agent for the WriterCon Conference this fall, and I have nailed down a week in Eureka Springs at the Writer's Colony at Derry Hollow for our summer writing retreat. All of this you'll hear about in the episodes to come. In this episode, I'm going to talk about the latest news from the world of books. I'm going to offer some writing tips on how to increase the sales of your books based on a recent presentation on the success of Amazon's own publishing program, Amazon Publishing. And we'll have an interview with Laurel Thomas, who's recently published her first novel, River's Call. She's done a lot of writing, but this is her first novel. Some of you will undoubtedly recognize that name, or perhaps if you see her face, you'll recognize her as the first face you often see when you check in at WriterCon, because she's been manning the registration desk for several years now. She's got her first book out, and I wanted to talk to her about what that's like, how how the book came to be. Uh, what made it successful, and what it's like to see your first book finally in print. But first, here's the news. The name Colin Kaepernick will be familiar to many of you who follow sports more closely than, frankly, I do. But, of course, the former NFL quarterback has been in the news quite a bit lately. He has also apparently written a memoir. But the road to getting it published has been a long one. It was first announced that his memoir would come out with Harper. That was back in 2016. Then it was going to be at One World, which is part of Random House. Neither of those ever happened. And in the past week, he's announced that he will be self-publishing the print and ebook editions of his memoir through his own company, which he's called Copernic Publishing. Okay, he didn't put a lot of work into naming the company, but I bet there's more work in the memoir. What I found particularly interesting, of course, is that he had a lot of options, but presumably never got the deal he wanted, and so now he's decided it's in his best interest to start his own publishing company. This is not unlike decisions some people, like Dean Kuntz last year, made publishing with Amazon Publishing, But apparently Copernic is even more entrepreneurial and has plans beyond this single book, and so he's formed his own company to self-publish this book, at least in the print, in the ebook editions. He's going to distribute through Ingrams, which is going to work in partnership with Melker Media. But listen to this, the audiobook, and we all know how important audiobooks are and how well they're selling these days, that will be sold exclusively by Audible. Audible, of course, is owned by Amazon, so he's not Amazon-free. But his company has formed a deal with Audible to publish not only this audiobook, but multiple projects by a variety of authors and influencers. So this might be a whole different kind of book, What I uh, kind of book deal. What I think this shows is how much the publishing world is changing. And the traditional norms and procedures just don't apply anymore, particularly 
to someone like this, who clearly either he has good business sense or people working for him do, because he's taken his time to do it right and has formulated a deal that will probably not only maximize exposure and profits for this book, but opens the door to many other audiobooks in the future. Another interesting study coming from the Codex Group in the past couple weeks indicates that of all publishers, and this includes traditional publishers, Amazon Publishing is doing the best job with its book covers. I'll put a link to the study in the show notes for this program so you can check it out for yourself. But the bottom line is that Amazon Publishing covers are getting clicked on the most, and those clicks lead to more sales, quote, particularly for less well-known authors without established fan bases, end quote, which suggests that, and isn't this what I've said on podcasts in the past, if this is your first book, that's where you want to be with someone who knows how to market new names, especially with the all-important covers. Probably knows surprise that Amazon Publishing, the publishing arm of Amazon, the retailer, number one retailer in the United States, is good at this and that their actions also lead to increased sales. couple of new romance imprints hitting the, the publishing world. Of course, romance remains the most popular of the genres. Skyhorse is launching a new imprint they call Palomino Press which will focus on contemporary romance, while Harlequin is adding a new trade paperback line. Uh, this will be part of Love Inspired, which is their inspirational romance imprint. And that popularity has now led to Love Inspired Suspense. These, of course, blend spirituality, inspirational, often very pro-family, pro-Christian themes with the traditional romance novel. Well, since we've talked in previous podcasts about how the Christian book market is one of the few that's actually increasing in popularity, and now we've got uh, romance novels as the most popular genre, this seems like a pretty inspired combination, and one you might think about submitting to or having your agent submit to if this is the sort of thing that you like to do couple of updates on stories we've covered in the past. First, I reported last time that Audible had settled the lawsuit about its proposed captions program, adding visual word-based captions to its audiobooks. The terms of the settlement are apparently that Audible will ask for permission first before it adds captions to any books that are still under copyright protection although they are going to go forward with some books in the public domain, mostly apparently books targeted towards students. Those are going to have captions, but anything else, they'll ask permission. We've also been covering and following the story involving Romance Writers of America and the uproar that followed the censure of Courtney Milan and one of her books. Last time I reported that the president, that the top leadership had resigned, now the entire RWA board has resigned. They're all gone. And apparently stating now that they're going to have interim elections. Who would run at this point? I, mean, I guess there's somebody, but I can't imagine wanting to step into this hornet's nest. I just hope this isn't the end of RWA as we know it. Very interesting story reporting that poetry sales are soaring, not only in the U.S., but the U.K., and you can find that in The Guardian online if you'd like to read it. But apparently last year, sales of poetry soared like never before, driven primarily by young people who they say are searching for clarity. Who's the most popular poet? Same thing in the U.K. as it is here. Rupi Carr, the young poet who built up her following on Instagram primarily, self-publishing work until she had such a following that she could get a much more lucrative contract with Andrews and McNeil. A more frightening story coming out of Missouri. There's a new bill that could theoretically ban 
uh, uh, could cause librarians to face charges, rather, for age-inappropriate material. It's been introduced, hasn't been passed yet, and I hope it never is, because this smacks too much of censorship. What they're apparently trying to eliminate is inappropriate programming that young people might step into. What the politicians keep talking about is a library that held had LGBTQ programming, specifically a, quote, drag queen story hour, and there were materials on display for that the children theoretically could have seen. I'm all in favor of protecting children. I'm not sure they understand what the greatest threat to our children is, but this reminds me way too much of, uh, in my home state, Oklahoma, a couple years ago, more than a couple, actually, several years ago, but comic book stores were under attack. One in particular, the owner was arrested for selling age-inappropriate material, sold an adult comic book with some graphic drawings in it. This book wasn't even out on display. They kept it under the counter. You couldn't see it. You couldn't even buy it unless you specifically asked for it. Nonetheless, undercover cops went in, asked for it, got it, and then arrested and charged the owner. Well, no. There is a a realm for adult, non-pornographic material. In that case, I think people were traveling on the cliche that comic books are all for six-year-olds. In the Missouri law, I think, obviously, it's hard to see this as not having some homophobic aspect to it. I am all for protecting children from harm. And the best way to protect children, of course, would be to go to the comic book store or the library or wherever with them and make sure they're not exposed to anything you think might be hazardous. One last story, which I saved for the end because I thought this was the weirdest thing I read about this week. You perhaps have heard of the Christopher Ewart Biggs Literary Prize. It's one of the top literary prizes awarded uh, usually in Europe. Well, this year, one of the items on the short list is not poetry, is not a novel, but is a particular writer's Twitter account. Yes, you heard me correctly. The academic Katie Hayward's Twitter account has been shortlisted for this literary prize based upon its fine writing. She's been writing about the implications of Brexit for the UK countries, and her account has been called a political and sociological account of that whole process and how it affects the people in this nation. And now she's up for this prize. You know, she's not the first person to use Twitter in a more serious way. At one point, Margaret Atwood was writing a novel in Twitter posts. Of course, Atwood could do anything, but this is a new, I guess I just need to put more time into my Twitter posts. I do try and tweet every day, but you know, 240 characters or less, I pretty much just report on what's going on and what I think writers might be interested in or talking about my books and whatnot. Maybe I'm selling it short and maybe you red sneaker writers can figure out how to turn 240 characters into something of literary merit. I guess it comes down to what has always been the message here at the Red Sneaker Center for Writers. If you're going to write something, do the best job you possibly can. For the writing tips section this time, first of all, I want to thank Jane Friedman, who, by the way, will be one of our featured presenters at the WriterCon conference this fall, for her report on a panel at the San Francisco Writers' Conference. As you may know, that's one of the top conferences. This was its 16th year. A few years back, I was their keynote presenter, so of course I think it's a great conference. If you can't come to WriterCon, and you should, but if you can't, this is a darn good substitute. Among other things, San Francisco is given credit for inventing the concept of speed dating with agents, just meaning your time with each agent is very brief so that you can see as many people as possible. I'm not sure if that's really a good thing or a bad thing, but at any rate, Jane reported on this panel. 